Welcome to Human Factors Cast, your weekly podcast for all things human factors, psychology, and design. You know, you know what they call this? Like they call this episode dedicated to the seal. Nah, this is Seal Pose Six. <laughs> This is not good. I'm, I'm going to see how long I can handle it. Anyway, hey, everybody. It's episode 122. We're bringing this to you just a little bit late this week. Uh, it's February 28th, 2019, and you're listening to or maybe even watching Human Factors Cast. I'm your host, Nick Rome, joined today by Mr. Blake Arnsdorf. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Good to be here on Thursday. There he is. Yeah, it is a Thursday. Excellent. Reason for that, really quick, top of the show here, reason for that, our good listener Tim wrote in. Uh, said that we had a ground loop. It still exists. Um, oh, it's definitely and, there. You know, in in attempts to fix it, we made it worse. And so, you know, we're we're gonna deal with the ground loop for one more week. We have a solution coming in next week. So thank you all to all your patient listeners. I think we're gonna try to fix it and post this time around. Now that we know what it is. Yeah, let's try. Uh, anyway, hey, we got a lot to talk about today from the news from last week. Microsoft workers are demanding the company cancel its $480 million contract with the U.S. military. The CDC confirms that Hawaii's false missile alarm was scary. This is an understatement. NASA is to close uh, is close to finalizing its drone traffic control system for cities. And are we doing this last one? Yes, I guess we are. Six crazy details from Alphabet's leaked plans for its first smart city. But That's first, so good. if you're listening. You can find us on YouTube, and we need more YouTube subscribers. So please go like, smash that subscribe button. That'd be really helpful for us. Make Jeff happy. Make Jeff the happiest man. There you go. In the YouTubes. In the YouTube. And hit that subscribe button. Um, Of course, reason why we're asking, we're not just asking for any reason, not just to, like, you know, stroke our ego or anything. We really need your help to get that slash name. It helps other people find the show easier. So that way we can say youtube.com slash human factors cast rather than XK nine G lowercase P, you know, all that stuff. Uh, Hey, we have our healthcare symposium giveaway Uh, that ends next weekend. So please do enter. If you are thinking about it, Uh, it is close upon us. We are going to have coverage from it. We're still ironing out the details. Uh, going to so, be lots of deeds coming soon, hopefully. Lots of deeds coming soon. We will have a slate of interviews, um, hopefully, hopefully. I don't want to promise anything we can't keep, but we will have coverage. Elise is going to be out there. Um, we, uh, yeah, details on how to enter is in the show notes. You can uh, do anything as simple as following us on social media uh, and as complicated as uh, writing us a review and writing it in. And we've had a couple of those. So thank you to those of you who have given us a review um, and if you're thinking about it, if you've been wanting to do it for a while, I encourage you, go go check out this uh, giveaway. It's the place to be. And then write us a review, because we'd really appreciate that. Yeah, reviews go a long way for us on any kind of podcast medium, but especially for Apple's podcast to get us up in the numbers. They do. And honestly, it, like I said, it all comes back to helping others find the show. If, if you give us a review that is positive, then potentially people will, uh, you know, listen to the show. So there's that. Hey, before we jump in, Blake, I want to know what's going on with you. Oh, man. So the other day I bought a brand new Microsoft keyboard because it was time to, you know, get something that was actually ergonomic for the office. And Okay, you know, I can't do seal pose anymore. No so more I seal pose? No, oh, no how long we make it? Four minutes, five yeah. seconds. Yeah, is that it? Okay. Yep, that's it. All right, I got 354 over here. Okay, anyway. <laughs> but anyway, so yeah. And believe it or not, it was harder to set up and get it started than I ever expected because they hot because nowadays a lot of, you know, keyboard and keyboard and mice combos will come with like a USB transmitter so that it can receive the signal. I had no idea where it was in this Microsoft package. Okay. But what saved me was not a user's manual, but pictures on top of the lid. Yeah, usually it's in yeah, there, isn't it? Yeah, that's, that's where I would expect it. It's somewhere in, inside the actual mouse. And it was in, yeah, it was in the keyboard. It was in the keyboard? Yeah, it was in my keyboard. Wow, okay. So pictures on the lid helped you solve this problem. Yeah, because it, it actually d- just like breaks apart each like item or whatever. It's almost like a little schematic of... Is it like, a exploded, uh, like an exploded... Yeah, it's like an exploded version of the keyboard. Just like yeah. this is the screw that you screw in to close the lid. Yeah. That kind of stuff. So it was nice because I was sitting here confused as why this thing didn't automatically hook up or whatever where this, you know, USB dongle was. 
And it was nice not to have to read a whole bunch of documentation or search anything on Google. That's putting it nicely. Yeah. Yeah, it is. <laughs> yeah no, I, th I think that's awesome. Um, I'm glad. It, 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 it kind of reminds me of like how Ikea does things. Kind of designs these schematics in a way that are, is cross-cultural um, and anyone can understand. It's not any pamphlet of... of uh, information and text it's literally just pictures yeah exactly and that was kind of the cool part to look at because there really was no words for it it was just a bunch of things like just a bunch of pictures laid out for you to get a sense of really where where the battery goes and the steps you have to take there i don't even think there are any words yeah. it's basically pull all the pull tabs and you're good to go oh and by the way here's the uh, dongle piece that you need to make yeah. everything work oh hey well great it's pretty cool what's going on do, you nicholas uh do they not air conditioning this room on thursdays they, they know... don't air conditioning this room specifically ever because they yeah. know i'm not here during the day yeah well okay anyway uh you know i missed okay so quick update i i talked about u8 a couple weeks ago on the show what is u8 that is the app that allows you to take pictures and subjectively rate how you feel about food. Got it. Thank you. Uh, so what I've done is over the past couple of weeks, I've actually, um, you know, logged every single thing that's gone into my body. And I can really start to tell like, hey, you know, over 50% of my food is prepackaged, which is fine. Right. It's better than like 55% of it being fast food for sure. Oh, yeah. Um, but, but I am noticing that my home cooked meals are like. 5% and I need to increase that. So it's, it's kind of cool to see at the macro level now that I have a larger sample size. Uh, I will say I missed my first picture last night. <gasps> How long really, have you been going for without missing a day though? Uh, like two, three weeks. That's really incredible. Yeah. To be really honest. Uh, but it's, it's kind of really simple to add something that you missed. Um, oh really? Yeah. So, so all you have to do, you just write text. So it's like, it's, it almost, um, is more rewarding to go in and put the pictures in because when you see just that text in there, it's like, it's like uh, oh, I missed a log, uh, so I, I missed know. it. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So it, it's that's almost... kind of interesting. Did you notice any trends, or can you tell any trends from, like, based on when you're eating out versus when you're eating at home? Have you seen in your subjective ratings, like, you like one more than the other? Do you have different, different like, satiety so, levels or anything like that? That's interesting. That's the next step I would like to take with this is see if I can export my data somehow and run some statistical analyses because I don't think I can correlate them as of now, right? It's gotcha. just global, descriptive, rolled-up statistics vice, you know, being able to say, like, slice and dice it say hey anytime i go to fast food i feel full and satisfied um or or you know guilty or whatever uh so there's all that that i'm i'm having to deal with so anyway that's that's kind of where i'm at with that sure um but yeah i don't i don't know i don't really have much else except this room is really hot seal pose didn't work uh our our audio equipment yo i can talk about audio equipment and how oh, frustrating that is goodness. no matter what we do this ground hum is still here and um, it's it's really frustrating because like we've looked up videos and everything on how to fix this, it just is not working. Anyway, uh, I think ultimately it might just be the uh, hardware <laughs> involved. Yeah, and we I may guess have so. To, we might have to upgrade. Who knows? But it's been kind of funny to go through all the different you know instructions on how to fix things or whatever, and then find out that we've got like com either conflicting answers or whatever yeah. we do doesn't. <laughs> solve the problem yeah but thank you again tim for pointing that out to us that's awesome yeah is this first one ready to go uh yeah, oh, the first <laughs> one's ready to go it was the last one that okay a little help okay well with that i think it's time for us to get into human factors news this is the part of the show all about human factors news find out what's been going on in the week of human factors this can be anything related to the field we're talking uh medical transportation psychology you name it you name it, Blake. I will. What is it? Military stuff and Microsoft things. Yeah, whatever it is. As long as it relates to the field of human factors, <laughs> it's fair game for us to put up on this pedestal and talk about on this weekly podcast that we call Human Factors Cast. Blake, what do we have up first this week? And we shall. All right. So Microsoft workers are demanding the company cancel its $480 million contract with the U.S. military. So a little bit more on this while Nick is trying to clean the sweat off his face. <laughs> it's hot in here. It grew it's from... really hot in here. <laughs> All right, Nelly, calm down. So a group of around 50 oh. Microsoft workers signed a letter today, last week, depending, demanding the company cancel its near half a billion dollar contract with the U.S. military to license its augmented reality HoloLens technology for the use in military combat and training. 
So the letter addressed to the Microsoft CEO and president was initially circulated as an internal memo and has now been publicly released. It takes issue with the use of Microsoft's technology to increase the lethality of warfare, arguing that it turns combat into a simulated video game and is further distancing soldiers from the grim stakes of war and the reality of bloodshed. Microsoft plans to release a new version of the HoloLens augmented reality headset at the Mobile World Congress later this week. I think that was literally this week. The employees' objections are also reflective of a larger tech won't build it movement by tech workers who are demanding a stop of what they feel is morally questionable uses of their company's products. While Microsoft has encouraged regulation and ethical debates over the use of facial recognition technology, it recently doubled down on its supporting of selling technology to the military and government agencies. So Nick, we talked about this on Monday, but we yeah. talked a little bit about it, the fact that it's interesting to see this from now Microsoft, because we went through this with Google a couple weeks ago, yeah. something like that. Um, so what do you think? How does this all make you kind of feel? So on one hand, I feel like um, I'm really saddened by the lack of disrespect for employees, right? And, and sort of like there should be more unions, I, I feel. Anyway, and it, the, that's a whole separate argument, but unionization would help prevent things like this where you have a voice of the workers that kind of fights back against this. Where uh, and, and I mean, we just found out a couple days ago that Microsoft is is defending this. Um, and, and, uh, so anyway, uh, that's just at the worker level and that's really sad and there's a lot of issues with that, but going up a step, I mean, we talked about this on the show where I, we work in the defense industry and I'm not sure where that line is for me, right? How close do I get to pulling the trigger? Thankfully, we don't work on a lot of those projects, so it's not something that I have to be, uh, super worried about. However, it, it is like a major concern if you're, if you're like, trying to decide whether or not to accept a job in the defense industry is or or just in general with a company that could work with the defense industry these are things that you have to think about and uh it like there's there's the two sides of the argument right there's the argument that i kind of fall on where it's like yeah you're making more efficient killing machines that are taking um th that are basically allowing people to kill without feeling any of the repercussions with that and that is both good for the people who are performing that action, taking the lives of other people, and bad for the lives that are taken. The other side of it is that by doing this, you reduce the amount of casualties involved, you um, reduce any operator error uh, that would potentially cause more destruction in some way, shape, or form, you are uh, saving on uh, future costs for soldiers right that don't have to go through ptsd therapy or anything like that because it's easier for them and more video game like i i'm of a lot of minds on this i still side with um i don't like getting close to the trigger and i would i don't know if i would i understand that companies have to take contracts in order for business so i don't know if i would personally push back against this it kind of depends on the details right but i mean I would push back and say, like, I don't want to work on this project. And I think if it's being sure. forced on them, that's a different story, right? Yeah, I mean, if, if it really means that these people just can't work on something else um, in lieu of, like, Microsoft taking this contract, or if it's just a social thing, like, they don't want to work for Microsoft, if that's what they're going to do with some right. of the products they've had their hands in creating, it's a tough battle for anybody that works in the defense industry and doesn't want to be like close to the, the ethical questions of where the trigger line is and how much what you're designing or what you're researching plays into it. And it's, it is a tough place to be, right? Because we've, we've talked about it. It, or, and maybe this is just my perspective on it. Right. And it's, it's hard to, it's, it's hard not to fall on both sides of the fence, but I do, but it feels like until war is no longer a reality in our the world we live in, which when that'll ever be, I don't really know. I couldn't predict it if I wanted to. I can predict it. I can give you the exact moment that this world will stop fighting. So when it doesn't exist anymore? Well, there's that. Yeah. So I, I'll give you two exact moments. So there's that one. Uh, and then the other moment, no, even after that, uh, we'll still, we'll still fight. But the exact moment is when there's going to be an extraterrestrial threat. 
because then we're all going to band together to fight them. There you go. Okay. So it's not infighting, it's outfighting. Outfighting. That's yeah. awesome. But I, but in <laughs> in seriousness, when it comes to that, it, it with that being faced as a reality, I mean, you you have to balance the choice of okay, do I save troop lives and ultimately maybe make them. And this is just no fun to talk about. I don't know why no, I picked it's, this story. Yeah, why'd you pick this because story? Because it's, it's really like, tough. This it's like is you, tough. Yeah, you've basically, you, you save troop lives and you make them more efficiently lethal. I don't know any other way to put that. Yeah, you make them um, killing machines. You you make kind of their job safer for them, but also more, let's say, accurate. It's the only other thing I can think of. Because, right. But there but there's still consequences that I'm I'm kind of not understanding from the article that's not really talked about. And it's talking about making this... Combat into a more simulated video game, which I really know. I know what they mean. It's kind of removing people from the forefront of the battlefield. But we've seen, and there's been plenty of stories of the like growing PTSD people get from just UAV piloting. Right. You ever seen Ender's Game? There you go. Oh, well, there's that. Look yeah. at the psychological destruction that that kid had to face. Sure. From realizing that his actions were real, and I mean there is deception involved with that, but like still, that's the same level that we're talking about here. Is like if you could. If you could frame it as a simulation and throw it into somebody, they would never know the difference. Yeah, exactly. And I think there are real life consequences that you can't get around as like an operator of any kind that fights wars or has to use technology. So I, I don't know. I think it's great to see companies, employees trying to have a say in the direction the company goes. And I think it's it's going to be harder and harder for some of these bigger companies that are especially that are dealing with such high tech for employees to really drive the vision because this is a lot of money like it's not we're not talking half a million anymore we're talking half a billion dollars to basically use the technology they already have and leverage it in a different way but but again i mean i don't know how i even feel about it or how i would feel as a microsoft employee if i got involved in microsoft to work on just innovative products and not to work on military things then right. this would be like a, a game changer and deal breaker for me yeah, so I want to take a look at the actual um, the actual letter here. Uh, this is written to the um, the CEO and president of Microsoft. There you go, CEO and president of Microsoft. Uh, I, I want to dig. In. I'm I'm not going to read the whole letter here, but I do want to dig into some of their demands. Um, first and foremost, they want to con cancel this contract. I think that's reasonable given the employees are uh, are are not okay with this. Um, they further ask for cease developing any and all weapons technologies and draft a public facing acceptable use policy clarifying this commitment. I think that is a pretty big ask for a company like that. I like I, I'm trying to think from the um, CEO's perspective, like you were saying, it's like a lot of money coming in. Right. You don't want. I, I think the ultimate solution here is just letting people work on what they want to work on and not forcing them to work on anything. Um, I, it might be, yeah, it's so tricky to talk about. It's really tricky to talk about, but it's hard to even know what the diversity is of what goes on within Microsoft. Because I honestly, th this is that demand, and maybe I'm confused by it. But since it's demanding of Microsoft, I'm assuming that number two, so ceasing developing all weapon technologies, that that's sitting inside of Microsoft's wheelhouse. So yeah. do they already do that? I had no idea. Right. Um, and then appoint an independent external ethics review board with the power to enforce and publicly validate compliance with its acceptable use policy. I think that's getting out of control. I, yeah. Look, like I'm all for um, listening to your employees. I just I feel like these are some demands that went above what can be expected of a company like this like i don't know and i and I, I could be wrong like i maybe my opinion could be completely wrong well yeah and if you're listening to this show that. and severely disagree with me please write in like I'm, I'm happy to hear it i just uh I, i'm not like writing it off like i understand the employees I, like i understand both sides here and it's sure it's just uh yeah. Well, anyway. with the last point, it's really difficult because let's think about that in terms of AI. Like, remove the military complex from it or context from it. I mean, I'm sure that there's plenty of different, like, machine learning pieces of software that Microsoft's putting together. And do they all need to go through an ethics review board right. and some sort of testing process that is like, okay, this meets all the things that are 
publicly validated. And th- once you start bringing the public into it, like I don't know what that's going to mean for a for a company that's of this size innovating this amount of technology. I think it's going to be really hard to implement and keep from slowing down the company. Yeah, I agree. But again, that's the that's the company approach. Maybe it's a great thing for the world in general. I'm not really sure. I don't know. I want to hear your all thoughts. Uh, please write to us on the Slack and and through email. We're we'll have that conversa- conversation conversation we're five thousand years old Flirt. email us don't throw email well get to it in like three weeks hit us up on yeah. twitter at human oh yeah cast. we do that too yeah, yeah. You, i don't that's think that's you. it either i think it's at h <laughs> factors podcast h factors podcast there that's we it. go all right hey what's next What's up next? So the CDC confirms that Hawaii's I'm really sorry. Missile... I did that as you were reaching for your drink. I'm sorry. I'm a bad host. What is next, though? <laughs> and then you can take a drink while you ask me what I think of it. <laughs> How about that? It's a Thursday, folks. We're... You thought we were off the rails on Monday? No, this no, is us Thursday on a Thursday. You worse. thought we were bad after one day of a work week? Nah, no. This is Thursday, four days in. It's, it's done. Tomorrow we're, is Friday. It's over. And... Yeah, okay, yeah, here we go. All right, let's, let's, let's restart this thing. Let's talk about the CDC and how they confirmed that Hawaii's false missile alarm was scary. Man, I needed their confirmation for that. Speaking of Twitter, so a Twitter analysis by the Center for Disease Control and Prevention has confirmed that people were terrified when they were alerted that a ballistic missile was hurling toward Hawaii. But when they learned that the alert was actually a false alarm, they were completely the opposite. They were livid. It's something that people watching social media would have already guessed, but this analysis could help emergency management agencies send better alerts in the future. One of the key themes that emerged in the aftermath was that some people didn't know what to do during the ballistic missile attack. According to the new CDC paper published in Morbidity and Mortality Weekly Report, that is a scary name for a report, in a, radi- in a radiation emergency like a nuclear missile attack, those instructions to get inside, stay inside, and stay tuned, according to the CDC. But of course, that doesn't really help prevent false alarms. But there's an, that's a whole other story. In this particular study, the researchers searched for tweets, or as they helpfully explained, Twitter postings, from the morning of, of the false alarm. The team specifically looked for tweets containing the words Hawaii missile, ballistic, shelter, drill, threat, alarm, and alert. And they ended up with more than 127,000 tweets of those were, most of those were retweets and quotes, which could be excluded to keep information to a manageable amount. But ultimately, they found out that people thought it was scary, and then they were really upset when they found that it was a false alarm. So what do we do about this, Nick? What can we do? Why don't you take a drink of your water? Oh, thank goodness. (laughs) So this is, okay. So first off, I have a couple thoughts on this. One, CDC is now using Twitter data for um, studies. How funny did we? How funny that I think that was on Monday when I was like, "This the CDC? I didn't know they did like Twitter analysis. I thought they were busy worried about like Ebola and stuff like that." But yeah, and, and I mean, it's a public interest type. I, I guess. So kind of. Yeah. I, so that is curious, right? Like I'm 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 looking into the CDC uh, mission statement. I just don't. Even, it made me question that I didn't know the purview of the CDC. Yeah, that's that's okay. So. They're they're saving lives and protecting people from health threats. Oh. Um, so I think the health threat here might be misinformation. Is that – can we call misinformation a health threat? I'm not – I feel like that might be a stretch. It, may, it might make sense, but, it, but maybe ultimately this benefits them because they might have to use mediums like Twitter – to make official announcements because so many people go right. to it for, you know, just news or announcements or anything like that. And I know social media has played a, played a big part in this particular crisis. Yeah, this is so, I, yeah. So first off, just weirdness around the CDC doing this. Second off, um, this is kind of uh, information that we all kind of anecdotally knew. And I'm curious as to what exactly, you know, they found that, that wasn't like a no duh thing, right? Like, I don't know. It's to me, it's just like yes, this is for sure. Um, but it, it, to me, it'll be the more deeper analyses that will that will kind of inform like, hey, the like maybe studying viral tweets, right? There you Regarding, go. Like, and maybe through that studying how viruses spread. I don't know. Like, they can maybe apply virus spreading models to tweets. And I, I like I, I'm really trying to struggle here for so for better. some applications of of this stuff, but I, I I feel like the 
high level, people were scared. Yeah, no shit. Like, <laughs> thanks, bro. <laughs> you think a missile's coming right towards us. No shit, we're gonna be scared. Yeah. Like, <laughs> and then we were pissed when it was like, oh, that was an accident. Sorry. Yeah, it, it, and you immediately turn around. You're like, later. how does this happen? Yeah. Like, yeah, you'd be pissed for sure, and I understand that. Um, so I'm just trying to figure out like what high level things or or more like niche things, I guess, are 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 they finding? I think I get I. I can help them out a little bit. Help them out. Please. So I think the ultimate point of this entire analysis was because the I don't think the heading did them any uh, justice at all, right? Because it's like, oh, this yeah. false missile alarm was scary. They could have named it better, and maybe it was clickbaity. Who knows? But I, the ultimate point of what they were trying to do is probably analyzing how these messages go out, the reactions that people get, and how many people really interacted with this kind of message, and potentially would we have to use Twitter and how do we best phrase things. Like, whether it's like, oh, we have some actual outbreak that we're going to put out on the CDC's Twitter feed. Um, and then what would happen if it was a false alarm, if it was a screw-up, somebody messed up or hacked the hacked our Twitter account or something like that. And how do you properly respond to get, right. get people to, one, understand what they should do? Because they call out that uh, nuclear missile crisis one or missile – nuclear missile crisis example where it gives these instructions that are kind of like oh that's ridiculous i'm not gonna it's not gonna save my life doing that so what could we as the cdc do when we po if we ever had to make some kind of emergency posting that's what i'm taking away from it it does like you said seem like they have to go a good bit deeper to give us some sure like, how are you going to inform the design of your you know tweets or whatever when it comes yeah. to this stuff i'm um, curious if they'll release any information like that I, I hope so, because it, it is interesting in the fact that we're seeing a giant organization like the CDC doing an analysis of Twitter to – info like, it, they're trying to – they're not just trying to say that the missile crisis was scary. They're trying to inform the design of some of these tweets they're putting together for scary things like this they experience. Yeah. All right. Well, we'll be back to break down the rest of the news stories right after this break. Human Factors Cast strives to bring you the best in Human Factors chatter every week. We pack news, interviews, reviews, and overall fun conversations into each and every product that we put our seal of approval on. But we can't do it without you. You see, the Human Factors Cast Network is 100% listener supported. All the funds that go into running this show come from the listeners. That's why we're giving back to our supporters on Patreon, now more than ever. Pledges start at just $1 per month and include rewards like 24-7 access to our exclusive Human Factors Cast Slack channel, personalized professional reviews, and Human Factors Cast Infinite, a Patreon-only podcast where the topic is human factors, etc. We're always updating our rewards, so stop by patreon.com slash humanfactorscast to see what support level may be right for you. Thank you all, and remember, it depends. Yes, please come. Stop by our Patreon. See what support level is right for you. In fact, it we are it. finally, after weeks of trying to organize a time for this to happen, we are finally launching our commentary of the American Space Program. 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 Uh, lots of movies, lots of documentaries. We are going to be providing commentary from a human factors perspective on all of this. You can only find it on Patreon. So please come over, join us. The time is now. You will hear it. Patreon supporters, stay tuned for that after show because it's going to be a doozy. We're going to get through the first third of uh, the, the right, right stuff, stuff because that's a long movie that we found out. So, it? yeah, it's like three hours long. Oh, goodness. Yeah. All right. So, hey, we'll, we'll stick around because we'll cover the first third of it. Anyway, before we move on, I just want to thank all of our friends over at Recode, The Verge, in Gadget, and Fast Company for all of our news stories this week. If you want to follow along, you can follow us all over social media or join our Slack for links to the original articles. Okay, Blake, we have two more today. Why don't we jump in? Two more. Let's go. All right, so NASA is ready to put drone traffic management system to the ultimate test and has chosen Nevada and Texas as its final testing sites. The agency, together with the FAA, has been developing an unmanned aircraft traffic management, or UTM, system over the past four years in an effort to figure out how to safely fly drones in an urban environment. Now that the project is in its last phase, it has teamed up with the Nevada Institute for Autonomous Systems in Las Vegas and the Lone Star UAS Center for Excellence and Innovation in Corpus Christi, Texas to conduct a final series of technical demonstrations. NASA and the FAA are planning to demo a big list of technologies, including their interface with 
vehicle integrated detect and avoid capabilities, vehicle to vehicle landing communication and collision avoidance, as well as automated safe landing technologies. All of those will help NASA understand the challenges of flying in an urban environment and conjure up ideas for future rules and policies. They'll also help put the agency help the agency figure out the best procedures to operate drones safely in overpopulated areas like Amazon's factories. Oh yeah. So Nick, this is a big deal for me personally because I I got in the tail end of grad school, there was a lot of like UAV studies coming to life, and a lot of it was dealing about how do you how do you integrate them into just the NAS in general, the national airspace, and what is that going to mean? And now we're talking about in urban areas, what do we do with flying around drones? So this is really cool to see coming to life and really going to be tested in the real world. Yeah, so uh, they are basically. Is this going to be separate from the air traffic control system? That's a great question. I would assume maybe. Yeah, I mean, uh, I wonder, are they doing, like, drone flight and have it, like, I don't know. Because the only real danger zones are going to be low-flying um, aircraft. And, I mean, like, if you think about navigating through a city, I think this is, this is a, a prime way to start with this. Because if you think about moving through a city... Um, you are limited by uh, verticality is only limited by the tallest building near you. True. So if you're in New York City, you know you're you're not gonna you're probably gonna fly at some trajectory away from like the tallest buildings, uh, so that way you're not gonna interfere with them. But I'm I'm imagining like th honestly when when I see this article, this is what I'm this is what I'm imagining in my head. There is literally a network overlaid on top of the grid system in city environments where um, there are multi multiple layers uh, and maybe they're all one-way streets, but it allows drones to follow certain paths throughout the city. Um, yeah, it's kind of like the multiple class of airspace that exists yes. now, just in a little, a lower, a smaller kind of area. A smaller, compact, uh, but yeah, that's so that's what I'm imagining. Now... Obviously, we're going to have very various types of drones. We're going to have delivery drones, surveillance drones. Um, what other types of drones? Not drones for fun, because I, I would imagine that you would have to go into an open air environment for something like that. Yeah, I think that's going to supply a completely different set of constraints on just like right. home drone owners, right. owners, because you're not just you're likely not going to just be able to fly it in the middle of just airspace. Because now this is going to become like you're talking about like sections of airspace specifically for drones that are actually serving a purpose. So right. it's, it's like you're dealing with the NAS, but at a smaller level. Yeah. So I, I'm, I'm wondering how all these things are going to play together, right? Do delivery drones take the bottom, uh, you know, the bottom levels where surveillance might be at the higher levels. Uh, and like, do you have to assign a classification to each drone? Um, when you are piloting a drone, does the system take over in the event where it's going to sort of uh, attack other drones, like not attack? In, like collision avoidance. Yeah, so yeah, exactly. Um, is there like rerouting software that we can put out there? Uh, I don't know. These, these are all kind of my ideas uh, with a very limited understanding of drones and airspace technologies. Well, and it sounds like they definitely have already the technology for vehicle to vehicle, vehicle, to vehicle communication and collision avoidance. So it's kind of like what you'll find in an aircraft called TCAS, and I do not know the full acronym, but I know it's a collision avoidance system. That's the CAS. The CAS. And it's... It's, so it sounds like there's something similar in there for these, or at least they've Traffic. Tried, tried to bake it in there. Well, that makes sense. Traffic collision avoidance. And now we've, again, in there, and another thing they tout is just having interface things built in that are about vehicle integrated detection avoidance. So I'm assuming that is a lot of like planning waypoints in case you are having trajectories of waypoints in case right. you're going to run into somebody. Yeah, plan um, B, plan C, plan D through F. The thing I don't know is how... I, how flight plan well i guess it's it's a lot in a lot of ways it's the same as an aircraft but i'm assuming you have to like file flight plans for all this kind of stuff in these smaller kinds of airspaces and then what happens if you have to let's say you've got like airspace a for delivery there's airspace b for something else i don't know what and c is like surveillance town 
what happens if you have to use one of the other pieces of airspace right. and what's the interaction look like and do you get clearance in between those like from an ATC or some kind of operator? Yeah. I don't know. And D would be personnel travel because those are going to be drones soon enough, right? Like That was always kind of a, what, a pipe dream of Google's, right? Well, yeah. Well, Uber, Google, all these companies. They're... And the weight constraints on there, like you'd have to get high enough. Right, the VTOL systems would have to push you up higher than everything else, right? Um, so clank a bunch of drones on the way down. So that's that's another thing too, right? Yeah, like it, it would have to prioritize the the human lives over everything else, or we'd have we'd hope so. Oh yeah, right, sure. yeah. So I mean, um, so that's a whole other thing, right? And then those drones are going to be larger than the other drones. So what does that mean for um, you know flight constraints next to buildings, next to um, potentially other hazardous obstacles. What does that mean for other drones that, like smaller drones that approach them? Um, can they can they all link together in this drone Voltron type thing, where they're working together to alternate power so that way it goes farther, longer? I don't know. Well, that's the thing that I don't really know is what a, when they talk about vehicle to vehicle communication. When, it, when you think of aircraft, there's a there is a fair amount of that that's going on, but you're still there's a lot of human in the loop. Yeah. Like what it, what does this really mean for drone operators? And if there is some kind of like quote unquote drone ATC sitting in a city. Right. And is there going to be like? Um, I lost my train of thought. It's gone. But I think it's a good reason to go ahead and test a lot of this because obviously, myself and Nick are not 100% versed in what they're going to put in place for this UTM system yeah it's a pretty light article but it's still fun to talk about and think about uh, yeah and i think this will ultimately happen. stress test it and let people see like oh yeah okay so it is really going to work or it's not and then yeah. here's things we can improve yeah for sure um let's see here i'm looking to see is there like an actual report by nasa because that might help there's got to be something coming out of it or at least like uh like papers that have been centered around the development of this project uh yes here we go uh key technologies to... airspace regular airspace regulator flight information management system hey now uas service supplier interface for multiple independent uas traffic management service providers and their interface with vehicle integrated detect and avoid capabilities. Vehicle to be okay, we already said all that. Uh, yeah, there's not much more details aside from that. That's it. Um, Keeping it close to the chest, NASA. Yeah. I want to know what the results are. Because there's yeah, been so too. much talk over the, I don't know, past five years about the integration of drones in the NAS, but now like we're talking about having delivery drones, surveillance drones, and how is this all going to work? Imagine getting hit in the head with a package on its way to get delivered. Yeah, a little bit more uh, background on this. So um, TCLs, what does that stand for? The, there are four phases. I don't know what the um, acronym's for, but they, they're breaking this down into four phases where in August 2015, they completed... Um, the basically starting point of the platform researchers conducted field tests addressing how drones can be used in agriculture, firefighting, infrastructure monitoring. Um, researchers also worked to incorporate different technologies to help with flying the drone safely, such as scheduling and geofencing. Um, so phase two completed in October 2016. I guess so this would be phase three or four because this is uh, oh. This is phase four. So we've we've had all this other stuff before. I'm going to keep reading this so that way everyone's aware. Uh, October 2016, they focused on monitoring drones that are flown in sparsely populated areas where the operator can't see the drones they're flying. Uh, phase three conducted in spring 2018. Um, this level focused on creating and testing technologies that will help keep drones safely spaced out and flying in their designated zones. And then here, of course, the four is what we just talked about. The final level will build on the results of the findings from TCL3 uh, while also working to test how the UTM system can integrate drones into even more populated urban areas. So it sounds like they've done a lot of this testing outside. Now they're moving into the urban areas. Um, so that's that's interesting. Yeah, getting the drones to work well and now stress testing the system that they've built around them. It's pretty cool. Yeah, package delivery, infrastructure inspection, uh, aerial photography, news gathering, public safety, and first responder operations. Wow, that's so, a large gamut of things, much more than surveillance and drone delivery like we suspected. Yeah, yeah. Epic. Well, I, I kind of thought the information gathering or the, the um, 
that was kind of uh, public safety's kind of <laughs> surveillance to me. Yeah. But um, but I yeah, didn't even I think about the like firefighter or medevac type stuff. Either. Yeah, that, we've that talked about it on the show before. Definitely interesting. Yeah, I mean, we've talked about those applications for sure, for sure. We've talked about the fire hose drone, and then we've also talked about the uh, the life preserver drone. Yeah, it's like the EMT of drones. Yeah, that's, that's really cool. Can you imagine a drone that just drops out a uh, like drones flying overhead? It just has a um, uh, AED device on board. Oh yeah, and then it it detects an event, and then it just drops the the that AED down. And it just parachutes right to you. Yeah. Woo! Can you imagine? Yeah, I can actually. Yeah. I feel like that's gonna happen. Isn't, isn't that weird that you can imagine that? Yeah, I never would have thought of it. Drones uh, just flying around the okay. city. All right, we got one more story. What's up next? One more story. All right, so we got six crazy details from Alphabet's leaked plans for its Smurf. 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 It's Smurf. first smart city. Smurf, Smurf. <laughs> All right, so a company named Sidewalk Labs wants to rethink how cities are put together. And we're actually getting a look at what will what that's going to mean in the lovely city of Toronto, where Sidewalk Labs is building a prototype neighborhood. So six crazy details from Alphabet's leaked plans for its smart city. And one of the most mysterious, innovative parts of Alphabet, which is Sidewalk Labs. So the company says that it imagines, designs, tests, and builds urban innovations to help cities meet their biggest challenges. In other words, Sidewalk Labs wants, wants to create a smart city of the future. In 2017, the company reached an agreement to build its first smart city in Toronto, a neighborhood called Quayside, developed on the city's waterfront. But there are still many details to be ironed out, and it all requires approval by the city itself. But... If Sidewalk Labs gets to go ahead over the green light, as it says, it estimates that the mini city where you could you could see here could be constructed within as little as five to six years. That's insane. That so is insane. As a result, what you'll see is a, is basically at first a concept, but it has hasn't been approved by Alphabet itself. So anything we talk about here is just kind of up in the air for whether it's really going to be put together. But everything you would need is going to be have to be greenlit, both by Toronto and various regulators. But it's a nice glimpse into what we may see here in the future from, what is it, Sidewalk Labs in Toronto. So yeah. we've got, like, basically six big, or six kind of what they called crazy features here. Six crazy features. The first one may shock you. Click here. Find more. Apparently, um, yeah. Yeah, we are clickbaiting here tonight. Uh, the first one is it's made of timber. Uh, this one's surprising to me. A fire? Uh, the, no, timber. It's fire. Don't understand. <laughs> so let's let's uh, let's see here. Um, well, timber like like wood, not like wood, wood. Not most like... definitely, yeah, not from concrete or steel, but right. timber. Timber, yeah. So I mean, one thing to me, like you, you always think of these hyper realistic features to, uh, looking places. They're all metal, plastic. Um, they are sleek. Uh, but this is getting at the, um, you know, the, the, the using wood. Using wood. Yeah. A bit, I bet you that's a big thing in Canada. Yeah. But anyway, so it looks like they're trying to evoke more feelings of this being a homey place is basically what they describe is why they want to use wood in, instead of like the, the typical, typical city construction that's very like modern or very urbanized or kind of like what you are, what you're associating nowadays with kind of big tech companies it's like something more earthy and that'll that'll you know hopefully bring more early adopters to the actual city for the first time yeah second point here it's modular this is not a crazy idea this is a, an idea that's been around for a long time it's not a crazy idea well wood's just as crazy wood is crazy i will give it that wood is crazy uh it's high tech and green also not crazy Nope, solar power. We've never heard of that before. <laughs> What's that? I don't understand. Um, yeah, no, I, I'm I'm really excited though, especially about some of the initiatives um, for renewable energy and um, green technology. I'm, I'm sure you can tell which side of the political aisle I align with, but um, yeah, geez. I mean, well, I'm just really excited about the technology, right? Like, I was literally, I found myself. We were on a hike this weekend, uh, and we saw solar panels on somebody's house, and um, I was thinking to myself, wow, can you imagine if we just had to require everybody to have solar panels on everybody's house? We could power businesses. Um, we could power the moon. We, yeah, we could power so many things if everybody had solar panels. And it's just, it's getting more and more easier and uh, and less expensive to produce and to install 
why not? Anyway, it's definitely that's like changing leaps and bounds because even a couple years ago, this was anecdotal and hearsay, but I had a couple friends that were getting solar panels for the house and it was a nightmare. Yeah. Because like there was all this, they had to go through and get permits from all sorts of companies that I won't name because it was right. going to, and because it ultimately is going to benefit them as tax write off, it does, you don't have to pay as much for your energy bill and stuff like that. So it was just a mess. Yeah. So here's where it's gotten easier. Uh, companies have come in and have said, hey, I can install these for you for free. They're yours. They're for free. However, all that extra energy that you don't use that you would normally get a cut back from the energy company, we're going to take. And that's forever. So they're, they're just taking it. They're just taking it from you. But you don't have to deal with any of the other stuff. That's insane. So that's it, Not bad. Yeah, I don't know. I, I, I want my money back. Yeah. Because if I'm going to be producing that, well, technically, I'm stealing from the sun. So, really. You sun stealer. Sun stealer. Goodness. Right. High tech green, got it. All right. Uh, subterranean level run by robots. This Finally. Is awesome. I love this. Here's the insane this is, part. This is a crazy idea. Pizza delivery, subterranean, pops up from the ground, delivers you a pizza, it's gone. And then they're, they've brought in a little bit of kind of Elon Musk's boring company idea with some more last mile services that are actually underground tunnels, which is awesome. Yeah. They're talking about delivery trucks, delivery drivers. Um, let's see here. What else we got? Um, yeah. This this is done at Disney World. Which, by the way, oh my god. I'm so glad <laughs> we're recording this on Thursday. They just released all the details of Galaxy's Edge. The, the Star Wars land at Disneyland. It's going to be so cool, man. Oh, man. I can't believe you didn't talk about it in your banter. I, I am shocked and appalled that I didn't talk about it in the banter. I am very is, confused. Okay, you know what? Uh, hold me to it, listeners. I'm going to talk about that next week. He'll forget. All right. <laughs> what other uh, crazy ideas do they have, Blake? So it looks like they're trying to keep you outside even when it's cold. So Toronto is notoriously a cold place to go during the wintertime for sure. But the architects looks like they're proposing features such as heated bike lanes. That sounds like fun. Well, that's cool. At least the, the, that way the, um, the the snow will never stick to the bike lane. Yep. And that way you don't have to worry about slipping on your bike. And it's also, gracious, if, done that. if they're just going to heat the bike lanes, I, I, I can't imagine why they wouldn't heat the whole road. But if they just heat the bike lanes... They get the uh, the trucks. I've only lived in snow like for two years of my life. So anyway, they, they get the trucks, the plows. They, they push everything off to the side. What's oh, on the side of the right. road? Yeah, bike lanes. Bike lanes. And that just heats up the bottom layer and then it just melts. Yeah, just uh, bring your Look water tires. It'd be good. Efficiency. It's pretty good. Efficiency. Um, and it looks like I think maybe this is even the craziest part. Yeah. Sidewalk Labs is going to pay for some of the project. Or is this the crazy part based on what I just said? Can you imagine... If they are controlling all this, they might have, uh, you know, a little bit more extra money to go to the uh, energy company. And the, they just say, oh, we'll take care They're of it. They're taking more of the and energy then they off it. the top. Yeah, maybe it's not so crazy. It, it might not be, man. It might not be. Yeah, Any other anything else? No, I kind of want to see this when it's done, though, if it gets approved and all that by Google and, or Alphabet, excuse me, and Toronto City proper. I'd love to go. It'd be a great excuse to travel to Canada. Yeah, it would. That came from... It came from. That's right. It's part of the show where we talk about it coming from not Reddit, Alrighty. not Reddit this week. It's actually Twitter. We had a uh, listener reach out to us. Uh, this is I'm gonna mess up your name. I'm really sorry. Um, this is Maruf Hater. Sounds right. All right, all right, all right. Maruf Hater writes, uh, "What's your impression of the term working as designed?" Uh, so this is of course the part of the show where we search all over the internet. Really. Uh, to bring you questions the community's talking about. So this is a question from our own community. Blake, I want to We ask opened you, up our Twitter feed we, and we pulled have, it. <laughs> yes, we have. Uh, and we've pulled in from Slack before. we pulled in from Twitter. we pulled in from Reddit. Um, oh, the yes. power of the internet. Yes, the power of the internet. So, Roof Hater, uh, what is your impression of the term working as designed? Blake, I am going to pass it to you first. What do you think working as designed means? I've... Did this one... I've thought about this a bunch, and I probably had a different answer on Monday that I'm going to give now. But I feel like when somebody say it's, says it's working as designed, that could be a slight that it's not working quite as well as it, you would have hoped it would. That there was not a great design process behind something that was built, whether it's software or product. Um, working as design, it makes me feel like it's a sarcastic term. Now, on the flip side of that, working as designed could be an awesome thing on on the flip side of that, let me say that more than once. 
Because it could be indicating, if it's not being sarc- sarcastic and cynical as I tend to be, that it what it's obvious that something was put together so well or there was such a good design process behind it that it actually allowed somebody to create something great. Uh, but typically, you don't really hear that come up much working as design. I don't know, Nick. What do you think this is really getting at, or how does this make you feel when you hear the phrase slash term working Tell me, as design? How did the phrase make you feel? Um, so, look, know. okay, so you're right, Blake. I think there is some pejorative uh, terminology. Pejorative. pejorative. Take it to GRE tomorrow? Come yeah, on. Look at this. No, pejorative. Uh, cool. it, it, yeah. So look, like working as designed, um, I tend to think of this in, in the more positive light. I, I like um, when, what? <laughs> Stop laughing. What are you laughing at? There's nothing to laugh at. I just, somebody say there's a problem with the system and I just imagine myself saying to them, what's a working as, as designed? Look, here's the thing. When you design something, you are there's an intent behind that design um whether or not it's the fact that you are trying to frustrate the user um whether or not that's because you do want to design for frustration in some cases surely uh, video games. like what's that video games video games and or uh canceling subscriptions and or anything like that right oh you're talking about dark patterns i i am no, so that so that's like one aspect of it right is like um working as design means that the users are following that path that you intended for them to follow while using this design. Sure, yeah, I think that is that is a positive spin on it, for sure. And whether, and I think really the connotation of whether or not that means um, a, a positive thing or a negative thing depends on what the context or what the intent is. And I think that's kind of what masking that question, right, or that, that, that phrase. Um, so like if, if, uh, if you had a really frustrating experience unsubscribing from a list of emails which that's perfectly and that was my intent working well that's working as design yeah uh i wanted you to be frustrated i didn't want you i didn't want to lose your emails um versus uh i made it really easy to sign up for something well that's also working as design right and it was a positive experience it was like hey you just plug into my google and pulls in all your information and boom you're done so I think, yeah, the context and the intent behind it uh, have a lot to do with how you color that perception. Well, I really like the negative aspects of what you brought up. Like if it's trying to unsubscribe or whatever it may be, like get off an email list. Like that is, that to me is truly an example of, yeah, it's working as designed. They ho- they're hoping that they put enough steps in between you and the exit strategy that you don't do it or they get to, re- get to retain you. Or when companies... If you're like, let's say you're ending a trial subscription, they say, hey, we'll give you three months more free if you don't unsubscribe now, that kind of stuff. That is that is a pretty good example of what it, working as design might mean. But I'd, I'd love to hear from Baruf himself. I apologize if we're not getting your name 100% correct. Um, but I'd love to hear like wh- where this question came from, like what sparked it and really what your opinion or impression of working as design means. Yeah, I would love the follow up. All right, that's going to be it for today. I want to get out of here and talk about some right stuff. Hey, hey, we're doing that. Please join us on Patreon for the right stuff commentary. Uh, and we're going to follow that all the way through the American Space Program. Special thanks oh, to Maru right. for writing in today. Uh, if you if you want to be featured on the show, too, you can also reach out to us on uh, Twitter or Slack. We do pull from those first before, uh, before Reddit. So, you know, check our communities first. Yeah. Or you can um, even leave a comment on YouTube if you'd like. Yes, do all of the above. Uh, we're across social media at Each Factors Podcast. If you like what you hear want to support the show, like I said, you can leave us a review and get five entries towards the Healthcare Symposium. Remember, we're doing that giveaway uh, that ends next week, so enter now if you want to do that. Uh, where can we find more information about that giveaway? Link is going to be in the show notes, or you can reach out to us on Slack. There's a lot of ways to do it. Uh, and, of course, you can always reach us at our home on the web at humanfactorscast.com. I want to thank Mr. Blake Arnthorpe for being on the show today. Where can our listeners go and find you if they want to talk about helidrones that put out fires? If you want to talk about helidrones that put out fires, you can always reach me at Don't Panic UX on Twitter or in our Slack under some other handle that I don't know. I think it's the Arnthorpe. There we are. <laughs> As for me, I've been your host, Nick Rome. You can find me across social media at Nick underscore Rome. Thanks again for tuning in to Human Factors Cast. Until next time, it depends! depends.